itself as divine or divine and it was kind of a John Waters world and he actually met divine he went to New York and met divine he dressed up as divine and pink flamingos for the midnight movies when they showed it in town and uh, so I wanted and he'd met John Waters a couple times even though he says in the movie he didn't and I wanted John Waters to be a part of this and I'd actually interviewed him I'm also a film reviewer and I was on the CBS affiliate and interviewed him for polyester back in the 90s so I wanted to get John Waters to be in the movie um, and I didn't want to call his agent because I knew immediately be ching to ching to ching you know you want fifty thousand dollars for him to show up so I didn't do that I said something will happen I was actually at an art gallery opening in Richmond and was talking to this woman who was going through on the way to her new job and I said where did you used to live she said Baltimore I'm like <laughs> turns out she knew John Waters sister and I said, will you send him something? I sent him a package of the interview I did in 93, and I went over to Donnie's house and shot him and his sister and his brother. It's pretty hilarious, because they're looking, the, the sister has two dogs on her chest, um, <laughs> and said, come visit me, you know, I'd love to meet you. And I sent that to John Waters' address that I had. And within two days, I got a call from his assistant, who was very nice, and she said, I'm sorry, Mr. Waters is no longer doing documentary, because I guess he gets called a lot for anything sick and twisted. And um, <laughs> But he said, I said, well, would he do something? Would he write a letter? Would he send me a, and about a week later, I got a nice postcard from him, which is in the movie, and I get to read it to Dirt Woman in the movie as a surprise. Uh, so that was my biggest casting coup, even though he wasn't in the movie, he still was a part of the movie. And he loved the, oh, I have to tell you this quickly, I can't publish this as a blur, but when he saw the movie, John Waters said that the Corker family, which is Dirt Woman's family, makes the families in his movies look like Princess Di. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you wish I could use that in print, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll go on this one because I'm passionate about this. Um, my favorite character is Modesto. He is, um, it screens right after this, but he is, he's got this handlebar mustache that would give Yosemite Sam a run for his money. He was 98 when we, 97 when we started filming. He was the face that I went to get the story of, number one, and he is the most philosophical twinkle in his eye. He lives with nothing, he has nothing, but he has so much charisma and character and grit, and he kind of became my boyfriend. So I have a 101-year-old <laughs> boyfriend now in Cuba, and uh, the town so embraced him. He was kind of a little bit lower. Cuba doesn't really have a class system, obviously, but there's a little bit of one, and he would be considered a little bit lower. But now he's you know, quite famous because of this movie of mine in the village, and they call him Marlon Brando in Cuba. <laughs> I'm proud that I was part of that. He'll write me love letters that also do things, you know, they request things like Stetson cowboy hats to bring next time I come to shoot and that, but he always signs it Marlon Brando. Oh. <laughs> How was that coffee? It looked really thick. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> it is, I was telling people it's ruined me for coffee. I go to Starbucks and I'm like, Okay, what's the smallest cup you have? Can I have four shots <laughs> and a little cream? You know, it's so good. And it is, it's like syrup. It was really, Oh, yeah. it's so good. If you haven't had Cuban coffee, I highly recommend it. Um, I had, well, I had, I had a narrative feature that's an ensemble comedy. And um, that was the one thing I wouldn't compromise. I was like, I really need a good cast to pull yeah. this off. I think every, feature like every movie really has like one trick to it mm -hmm. and I knew the trick to this film would be a great cast so that was the one thing I, I wouldn't I push back a lot with my producers and the production company and so um, you know and, and, and I insisted to get a casting director you know you always start small and they're like you can't have a casting director I'm like no I need a casting director I need a good cast so I hired a casting director who you know was really great and again cut her cut her fees and um, to do something small and you have to kind of rally people behind your your idea and and your messaging um so she was like i think you should send the screenplay to rita wilson who was really out of my league at at that point because i have it's a very small movie and um but she was like i think that you know rita will connect to your screenplay because she likes multicultural stories she likes female stories and she supports women directors so we sent her the screenplay and um and she immediately wrote back and Ugh. and I got a meeting and so I got this like one door open yeah. and um and then you know once she met with me she kind of felt like she could trust me and and w came into the project and then because of her I was able to sort of get 
also like more veteran kind of luminary actors. Um, so it is, it does have like a kind of a domino effect of like one person signs on and it brings on other people. So I think that's a really good thing to strive for is just getting that one person to support you. Um, and then that's she, and then I, my dream was for Shohar Agdashlu to play the Persian mother in my movie. And so they were really good friends. And then, so she contacted mm -hmm. Shohar. And then Shore signed on, and then I told Shore that my dream character for her, to play her husband is her husband in real life. And then she was like, I'll take care of it. <laughs> so, so her husband in real life came, and um, he's an like a incredible stage actor yeah. and is like really popular in the Iranian community. So then he came on, and then Peter McKenzie came on, James Eckhouse came on. You know, it, it really is like a domino effect. So what I did you do to help that you had incredible chemistry between all of them? What did yes. you do to make sure that was fostered? Well, the, I, my two leads are newcomers. They're mm -hmm. unknown, and this is their first movie. So um, they were, they had a lot of rehearsals together. So they were meeting a lot together. They were rehearsing, and they improv a lot. So they had a lot of time together. But everybody else, like the big luminaries, they, I didn't have any rehearsal with them, so I would, you know, I carved out rehearsal time on set. Mm -hmm. um, so I would rehearse with them like, you know, 10 minutes before we wow. shot, um, which was really challenging. But, you know, they're such veterans. I mean, they can just nail it. They have so much experience. Whereas, like, the newcomers, I think, I insisted on rehearsal. Yeah. So it's, it's like every actor has a different set of demands. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, very similarly for our film, um, you know, cast was everything. Um, we have two amazing lead actors, Janine Mason and Josh Zuckerman, um, and this beautiful ensemble that I adore. I adore everyone in our, our film. Um, we were very lucky. The first person I ever thought of for the role of the bride was Janine Mason, and um, she's actually an alum of this festival as well. She was in The Archer here two years ago. Um, and. Uh, and she was in another short of mine called Waffles. And so luckily, um, she read the script and she loves Brian's writing and immediately signed on. And that was like, all right, we're, we're good now. Um, I just really needed her to do this. Um, and then she's known Josh. I actually asked her who she thought would be good for this. And she immediately said Josh. And we went to go see a play of his. And he's just perfect. I mean, he was everything that this character was, was written to be, just bumbling and kind of you know, insecure and uh, hilarious. And uh, so the two of them have played a couple, um, this is their fifth time playing a couple on stage or on screen. Um, so we just, the chemistry was built in between them and uh, we had one rehearsal, but um, you, you know, it was, it was just already there. They're just so good. Um, and very luckily we, I came up as an actor, so I know a ton of actors and I love casting and I love trying to figure out which person is the best for this particular role. And so we, most of the cast, the ensemble cast, we knew either from our days at NYU or in LA in theater, you know, just classes and different networking groups and stuff. So most of those people are just friends of ours and we ask her to come on and do a couple of lines, one or two days of shooting and every, you know, everybody just said yes. So we were, we got very lucky, yeah. Tim, how are we doing on time? Do you want to open it up to questions? I don't want to hog the stage. So who, any questions? We've got a mic over here. Hi, I have a question for um, Ms. Ann. Um, when you have concerns about traveling back to China, uh, yes, this is one of our concerns, uh, especially for Nan Fu, my co-director. In a film, she uh, interviewed many of her family members. So, uh, but st our film just came out in January, so we don't know yet. Maybe next time, it just depends what we do there. If we were doing another documentary like that's politically sensitive, mm -hmm. we definitely have to be very careful. But uh, if we just stay visiting, uh, visit family, uh, I don't know, maybe we'll be asked questions like by the s uh, state police, but uh, it's hard to know. I think the government is worried about the influence of the film. I think the more publicity and the more influence yeah. it has, it, it puts us in a like, more difficult situation, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah, it puts us in a dilemma. So yeah, it's hard to know, yeah. Well, thank you for telling that story. 
Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I had a question about Campesino. Um, what surprised you most about the time that you spent in Cuba? Um, the, uh, the people I met, I think, surprised me the most, and how open and generous they were with their stories. Um, well, I'll say the people, definitely. I mean, that was, I've never met people like that. They kind of inspired me to even live a different life. I kind of became a campesino myself and live on a ranch now. But um, another thing that surprised me is Cuba has no concept of fame. So they have no TV or film, really. So one of my biggest surprises is when we'd whip out a camera, no one would change. You know, no one would suck their stomach in or, you know, there's none of that. So you were able to grab the most authentic moments that it was pretty breathtaking. Hi, this one's for anyone who wants to answer. Um, what are some things you wish you knew the first time you made your first film? Uh, for me, it was having a great DP um, and someone who really understands lighting and cinematography. Um, I mean, that's that. For me, that was the biggest lesson of my first, very first film. Um, that I wish I'd had a. I, I think this the film overall would have been stronger if I had um, just somebody who was more into the nuances of how cinematography and uh, can lead and tell the story and the tone, set the tone for the film um, with lighting and color and all of that. I'll probably answer that too. Um, one thing that people always talk about and it just seems like something that y everyone's thinking about but you don't, you really need to think about it the entire time is, is focusing on character and you know, you say like, you know, I'm, I'm focusing on what the character, what's important for the character, and then you have an idea for something to be really funny or something to be really cool, and then you want to do that, but then you're like, well, that really wouldn't make sense for the character, and you have to fight yourself because it seems like something you want to do as a filmmaker, try something cool or fun, and it's usually not good for the movie. And, and coming from shorts and then going to a feature is something really hard to do because in shorts it's easier to do that and get away with it when you're watching someone for an hour and a half though, like people need to stay invested in the character's like mindset. And that was something I fought myself for the entire shoot. I'd have to say the biggest thing is learn to trust my own instincts and what's going to happen. I mean, I've been obviously making videos for 45 years, so I kind of know some of that. But there were so many times where I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to get this done. Like people I wanted to contact, every photo I had, and there are dozens of them, I had to have permission. It took me months sometimes to locate one photo, and sometimes I'm like, I just, I, I just can't do it. And then it would always somehow something magical would happen, like the way I got John Waters. I would meet somebody or I would find somebody and suddenly, wow, it came through. So just learning to trust that, hey, it will happen. I just have to keep working at it and figure out a way to make it happen. I think also not being afraid to ask. You know, I think you have to ask and ask and ask for favors and you have to reach and, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it's your first film, so you're a little bit shy you know and you're, you're like am I worth the risk and you know so I, but I think it's 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 okay to ask and sometimes those asks uh, come through and sometimes they don't so but it's it's always worth it to ask so that would be my advice yeah. I would say for documentaries um, what I learned on the first documentary is how much work is in post and that that's okay uh, you're really writing the script in post and that was something that I wasn't aware of going in. Now, luckily, I'll just say, I am an editor, so I edited my own piece. Mm -hmm. So I, kinda, I was editing it over the year and a half that I made it. So I absolutely changed the story. The first cut was totally different than the second cut. Mm -hmm. Such a good resource to be an editor. Yeah, yeah. and actually, I, I showed it to people, the first mm -hmm. cut, and they were like, eh. So I completely yeah. reworked the whole thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, mine was a narrative feature um, and was not a documentary, but that still changed in post a lot. I mean, it, it still was written in post. I mean, I, I edited it as well. Um, and the first cut to the last cut, it's completely different, honestly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think we just, in editing, we try to create a structure that's um, it's, it more, it's more closer to the bigger tools. We create a film reality 
but it's, it helps us. But I think the bottom line is that it has to be journalistic sound and factual, and everything should be very like, sound journalism. But you can, but it's a storytelling, so you want the emotion to be in the foreground. So we cut down a lot of um, details that's not, that's not, uh, that's not um, helping the story to mm -hmm. move forward. So it's a film reality and a journey to help us to get to the more, uh, the bigger truth, yeah. Mm -hmm. these, these films are all, sound like all passion projects, which is wonderful, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your plans to recoup some of those investments that you, you might have. Are, did you start your distribution plans when you were making it? Are you hoping to pick up distribution on the festival circuit? I'm just real curious, how, where, what's the next step for all these films? Um, I'll go. I just signed with a sales manager, which was so nice because they do it. <laughs> it's like one thing, one hat I don't have to wear, but um, sales manager and then he starts shopping it. So festivals are such an amazing opportunity to start to get some momentum on your film and to get to build a bit of an audience and it gets other people to pay attention. So very grateful to these festivals that take, I mean, it's really you're, I'm always just in awe and so happy when we get accepted to these festivals. And that has given us the momentum to get a sales manager, which will hopefully lead us into, you know, the kind of distribution that will get it out there the most. So we're just starting that. But that was always the goal, but I didn't even worry about distribution, which I should have. I bet they're gonna say better answers that you're supposed to be thinking about that all the time. But now I probably would think about that a little bit more at the beginning. I'm, I'm with her, I, I, I just have no idea what's gonna happen. Um, I. Uh, I mean, we've got like a couple small, a couple offers, but I mean, nothing we really plan. I always plan just, you know, to make it for as little money as possible and hopefully get our money back. I just wanted to, you know, make a first feature. Um, turned out okay, so maybe we will get our money back. But uh, yeah, I think that get, like getting into as many festivals can get more eyes on it. And you know, for me, I want. I mean, I don't know what traditional distribution, but like streaming would be completely, I mean, that's the kind of movie this would be anyway. People, this is the kind of movie people just watch in their bed before they go to sleep, so. Um, <laughs> so, I don't know, we'll see what happens. I don't know. Yeah, I, everyone, like, I just wanted to get in on yours because I feel like all of them are going to have really detailed plans <laughs> that I did not have. No, I don't. Um, I, I actually, wrong crowd. Your, your yeah, right, wrong crowd. Yeah. I actually uh, am working festivals uh, this year. I'm 69, perfect year to be promoting Dirt Woman. And uh, so it's my last chance. And I, so my husband and I actually took this year off to not go on a vacation, but we're doing film festivals as our vacation. And so it's a great place not only to have a good time and you know come back to my home state. I was born and raised in Florida, uh, but also. Um, to meet other people, to learn about sales managers and producers reps and all these things that come come at you and whether or not they're worth it or not. I've learned from showing at the two festivals I've been at so far that this is a very unique audience and it definitely is gonna take some special uh, marketing to get it to places. I don't expect it to ever play in Regal Cinemas. You know, it will play some art houses, hopefully, and then it'll go to streaming. But again, finding the right person that's gonna help me make that happen, if it doesn't, I'll be happy to play it in Richmond because the Richmond audience will eat it up and it can play there uh, at one of the cinemas for until it stops selling tickets and then I'll retire and travel. <laughs> uh, um, uh, just in terms of shorts, just because it's a different beast, um, I think going into making a short, you kind of have to understand whether or not you, what you, your purpose for making the short is. And this was really a calling card piece for us as a writer-director team. Um, and after shooting last April and finishing the film in August, we eventually signed with our management in LA um, in November. And so it really did one of the things that we really wanted out of this film, which was to get representation. Um, I'm trying to work as a feature director, um, both on our own projects and for hire, and as well as television. So this film for me is just gonna have, I wanted to have the widest audience possible. So we're doing the, the film festival circuit and we will probably release on Vimeo uh, this summer through um, several outlets and um, uh, probably up on iTunes and all that. I just, I really want everyone to, to just see it. That's, that's, there will be no recouping of money <laughs> for this film. 
I mean, I even uh, my film has gotten picked up, and it will be. It, it has distribution, and the movie will be released in the fall. Um, and that was great. It was such a like a relief kind yeah. of. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. Um, but even still, like probably not going to recoup. I mean, it's it's uh, you know the way the independent financial structure is is like it's really like the distribution company and just hopefully getting your investors money back and then like the filmmakers are like way 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 down at the bottom <laughs> so like it would have to perform exceedingly well for us to recoup anything um really it's like independent features is not the most lucrative investment <laughs> it's really like uh just building your body of work and hopefully you know it's it's a calling card for um doing bigger projects um, so, you know, it just, it's, yeah, it's, it's not like, you know, it's not the best stock <laughs> for like, but, um, it is, it is professionally and artistically. Yeah. So you have to be willing to take that hit. Yeah. Uh, for us at the beginning, we didn't think about distribution at all because we just focused on making a, a good movie as good as possible. Um, yeah, it's not a it's not a career to make money, and because we we just um, be driven to story making, but our passion and but but yeah, later on uh, because because it has, at the beginning there's so many other things to worry about like finding like budget and everything and just all the, for our film specifically it's a, we took a lot of political risk so it was like um, not. We didn't have too much energy to think about distribution as well. But later, uh, we, because we got a great uh, producer involved, so they make good distribution um, plan. And we also got funded by ITVS, so it's going to be broadcasted on PBS and also European uh, broadcaster, um, Arte. So I think if you work hard enough and then you make a good, mm -hmm. the distribution will come to you. And then uh, at Sundance, we'll, uh, we got picked up by Amazon. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be released uh, in uh, theaters uh, in August. And oh. yeah, uh, in LA and New York, and we'll expand from there. Uh, it will be on Amazon um, uh, Prime later this year. But the, uh, the thing for us is that we couldn't, we cannot release in China. There's no distribution because of the censorship there. So this is uh, something that's kind of heartbreaking to us because it's a film about our generation and our parents' generation, and we cannot release it in, in China. But hopefully, because of uh, Amazon can stream it online, so a lot of Chinese audience can hopefully use VPN to watch it on Amazon. So that's something. That's uh, work out great for us, yeah. And I'll just say one last thing, a great resource that someone told me about is that Sundance ha now has a self-distribution initiative uh, for features, if, uh, and they, their main thing is we will, we will help you do this whole self-distribution thing and give you funding, um, but we want you and us to be completely transparent about how, where the money comes in, where it goes out. So um, last year was the first year they did it, um, so you can go online and find out information about how these people have self-distributed their features and how much money they've made and just get some real numbers, which I think is really wonderful. Thank you. So the question being, how do you juggle financing the film and, and all of making a career out of it? I answered that already, so. We've got some moms on the panel. Y'all should talk about it. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah. We, I don't make money filmmaking yet. Um, I have been hired as a director on some shorts, um, but yet is a great is the word keyword. that we love to keep using. Um, and when I am not filmmaking or at festivals, I am at home with my two girls. Um, and luckily, my husband um, works and d does work as a writer, so he brings in income for us to survive. So hopefully, keep going with bigger things yeah. beyond this. <laughs> yet, yet. Yeah. I think it's kind of a balancing act between doing things that pay more and then doing documentaries. <laughs> but, um, so like next is a TV project that we're in pre-production. So you kind of have to pick your projects um, and then you got to just love it and find ways to do it. 
Yeah, I think you have to have a side hustle. I, you know, I haven't made a living as a writer or director yet. So I was an editor, and that's how I make my my living is editing. I've edited some feature documentaries. I've edited narrative films. Um, I've yeah. So like editing is has been my sort of B career, which is what's what's allowed me to survive and make my films. So I think you have to have a side hustle until the filmmaking takes off and becomes your A career. Yeah, and my goal is to be able to work full time as a filmmaker. Yeah. So it's not an easy goal. So yeah. yeah, especially now I'm making, I'm trying to make the next movie and I find that, oh, I have to, I have to uh, p uh, pay for all the expense myself again and then the main, the, when the salary I got for my previous film will go to my next film to pay for the expense. So it's a little, um, it's always not easy to start a new one, but uh, yeah, I hope that someday, yeah, it's, that you can just work full time and just create it, just be able to do all your creative work, yeah. We crowdfunded. Yeah, is that what you said? Who said? Yeah, uh, yeah. We crowdfunded um, fourteen thousand for our film. But as I mentioned, it is a it is a one. You have one shot at it, really, because it's your friends and family. And unless you have something that goes viral, which is usually more with products and with films, um, or maybe you have a, a, a celebrity that helps you, um, it is really you kind of tap that resource one time. So it makes sure it's worth it. I oh. crowd harassed. <laughs> I, I got the people that I wanted to work with me and harassed them to do it. I've got a question up here. Um, a heartfelt congratulations to all of you. Job well done. My questions go out to uh, Foster and Sarah. For Made Public, they say that film is a reflection of life. And I know that you had mentioned that you had seen some things on Facebook on how um, people were asking the, their audience on different decisions in their lives. I'm curious on how dark or how serious you think that will go as we move into the future with, with um, social media because social media has just gone absolutely insane in these days um, and it's nothing compared to what we thought it would have been when, when it first started. And then my question for um, Simple Wedding. I lived in Korea for about eight years and culture shock is one of the biggest things, um, especially when it comes to whether it be African American or Caucasians that are dating Koreans. And that, that culture bash or that culture hit, it hit anybody who wanted to date a, um, a Korean young lady or even a Korean man that wanted to date a foreigner. So uh, my question is, do you ever think that we'll see a world where um, that culture shock is not as prevalent and not as serious? I think, yes, that's what I want to say. Cool. <laughs> great, big, great big questions. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I do, you know, I do find the social media and, you know, where technology is headed in general to be quite terrifying. Um, <laughs> Black Mirror, anyone? Um, you know, it, it, but I also love comedy and like to bring levity to all of my films. I think that's sort of what unites us as as moviegoers, you know, to have somewhere that you can relax and, and laugh. Um, so I, I like to bring a comedic bend to it all. Um, but I am concerned. I am um, a little bit terrified for my kids. Uh, I think me and I are talking about um, how her, can I tell your children, saying, uh, you know, this, oh, we're having this, this is an Instagram moment. And she's like, no, it's just a moment. <laughs> you know, um, that is, but that is, her kids are a little older, but that's, a little, that's strange, but also, you know, <laughs> um, I'm getting older, maybe this is just how things are, and I just need to get um, the times, but, you know, I use Instagram and Facebook and all, all of those things, so I, I try to use them as tools, um, but they are how I connect with lots of people, so I'm just in, I'm, in, I'm particularly just trying to check myself and keep balances um, for myself and my family. Um, I don't know where it's headed, but it is a little bit scary. Uh, so, you know, keep it, in, keep it in balance. I just want to throw in, you didn't ask me, but real quickly, social media, if I hadn't had social media, especially Facebook, I wouldn't have half the resources that I had because I would just put something out and say, who, who has this picture or who has a picture? And I would get responses. And mm. at least half of the stuff that I got was somebody contacting me. Yeah, for good or for better or worse. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's both spectrums, yeah. yeah. Um, thank you for the question about multiculturalism. Um, yeah, I mean, I hope 
I believe in multiculturalism so much. That's why I made this movie. That's why I'm a filmmaker. That's why I feel like I should be telling stories. Is it's really the the issue that I care about most is you know multiculturalism and feminism basically and. Um, my whole family embodies that. Like I, so much of my family is like the UN. Like everyone has <laughs> married into a different culture. I'm like at an intercultural wedding every other summer, and um, and that's kind of what inspired me to to write the movie. Is like it's so it's like one of the most beautiful things when like love transcends tribalism and and religious and cultural difference. Um, so I believe in it very much, and I see multiculturalism thriving in a lot of societies like Canada or, you know, in, in, the, in, in parts of this country. I think, you know, even touring with this movie, it's been so surprising how, how people are embracing it. And, and like, you know, they have stories like yours of like, you know, there's so many intercultural couples that come up to me after the wedding and they're like her father and her mother and they're so different, but like it works, you know? And I think that's just, that's really like my hope for the future. I think it's, it's such an incredible thing to, to mix it up, have those intercultural babies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi, so I have a two on one question, basically. One, did you, if you had a specific um, target market in the beginning, did it change during the process of your movie? And as well, and also what, also, what legal processes did you take in creating your film? Well, I had lots of, I, I knew my audience pretty much up front was gonna be the John Waters slash gay lesbian crowd, so that hadn't changed. But in terms of, <clears throat> of getting clearances, I had dozens of pictures and somebody said, well, if it's on the internet, you can just use it. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> so I spent literally months tracking down one photograph to get the rights to it. But everything I got was, you know, was cop, was, I had a release for everything, every person I talked to and every image. And there were a lot of those. Actually, a real quick story. Um, there was, remember Current TV, Al Gore's TV channel that lasted for about three years? There was a story about Richmond, and the guy came to Richmond and interviewed Dirt Woman. And somebody told me about it and gave me the clip. And Current was bought by Al Jazeera, and I wanted to get permission to use the clip. I spent six months trying to get somebody at Al Jazeera to contact me. Nobody would respond. Emails, phone calls. I got a phone number in San Francisco, and it was dial by name. I just started J-O-N-E-S and leaving a message. Nobody responded. Six months this went on, and I wanted this clip. I was at lunch with a friend, and I happened to be telling her that story. And she said, oh, well, you know Leah Lamb, who my daughter went to high school with, she worked on that show. <laughs> Long story short, within 10 minutes, I got home, contacted Leah through Facebook. I had signed releases from her and the talent. But it took me six months just to get to that one little mm -hmm. tiny place. For the releases. Um, Nobody else. The Target market was your first question, right? Um, target market. Uh, it is something you need to understand. I don't think, I don't know, um, it's something that people will ask you, especially during crowdfunding. Um, it's important that you know who your target market is. Um, I think we thought originally that our film, which has a lot to do with social media, would be kind of in that 20s and 30s range, um, people who were getting married or recently been married. Um, and then we certainly discovered the, the, the gentleman who was the head of the Emergence uh, Award, who gave us the award, um, was sort of a, dad and his, well, he may be 50, something like that, and he freaking loved this movie and the script and loved it when it's the final product, and that ended up being our market really primarily was um, sort of a little bit older married couples who've been through the a bunch of weddings and also are kind of like, I don't know if I fully understand how much social media is influencing. This is crazy. Um, so that we have had a lot of really great response from sort of that crowd, um, which was surprising to us when we had the script. Um, and then in terms of legal releases, I mean, um, for us, it was mainly just, you know, you have to have clearance from every single person that works on your set um, in order to, if you ever want distribution um, of any kind, so you really need to get a, a release from everybody. So we had a wonderful producer named Lola No, who unfortunately can't be um, at this festival, um, but she was in charge of all that. So everybody has signed waivers and releases part of their crew deal and uh, deal memos and uh, and then the music as well. So we, we got our song from Clans um, and we it just, my brother is in the music industry, and so he played our music supervisor for this film, and uh, and found that song and got that song for us. So that was just a you know email contract. So and that's how we got our releases. 
Yeah, I think my target audience, I thought it was going to be like this like 20s millennial crowd. And in fact, it's turning out to be a much more like multi-generational audience. Um, and it's, I think it does appeal to like an older audience too, and partly because of Rita's storyline. And um, so that's been cool that it's sort of, it is, it, it, there isn't one age group. I think it appeals to like a, a, a broad audience. Um, I think legally, you know, you have to set it up, you know, the way a traditional narrative movie works. So you do have to like get a lawyer in place before you, you engage with anybody. Um, and I learned that the hard way. <laughs> so there is a lot of like legalese that um, you have to know and get set up with. I think with documentaries, it's more complicated because of like, you know, but I think in narrative, it's, it's more traditional, the legal route. So all those people in Cuba had to sign releases? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah uh, similar with the, like, the, I thought it was going to be a 20s millennial thing because um, it's just about 20s millennial, but then I realized that I guess a lot of older people have had trouble with customer service. And <laughs> probably oh, probably more so everyone. than younger people with the technology. It's a universal um, theme. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, so that was interesting. I, like the fact Tim was telling me a lot of the older people um, came to see my movie and liked it, and I was really confused because there's like porno in it. It's like really, it's like a pretty aggressive movie, and I was like, okay, cool, that's that's nice. But as far as uh, legally, yeah, we had to get entertainment. A lawyer involved early on because you know a lot of people worked for free on my movie, which means they worked for like Equity, and we had to do a bunch of contracts with that. And with music, uh, we have an Ario Speedwagon song in the movie twice, um, which we cannot afford to buy for distribution. And hopefully, whoever buys it will keep it. But for for uh, th like for festivals, it's like two thousand dollars for a year, which I thought was completely worth it. I think it's like fifty thousand dollars if you want to put it in the movie for real, like on Amazon or something. But that's another problem that I have put under the rug for now. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, I would definitely suggest going to an ent entertainment lawyer up front, though, because you're going to hit a million problems at the end if you don't. Yeah, I'm paying for that. I'm taking that out of the rug right now. Yeah. Where oh, right. I'm, I have to replace all of the music in my film yeah. because oh, wow. we used really expensive yeah. music that we got cleared for festivals, mm -hmm. but not for distribution. So I'm in that process of like dismembering. So sad. The, yeah, it's, it's a very sad process. Never do it, just, just, just yeah, get that's, free music. That was some advice I got. <laughs> so I got the whole music supervisor and went and found music that I could have the rights to for yeah. the film before I did festival. Because they also say, don't get so in love with the music yes, you pick. It's very because hard. you're gonna find out it costs an outrageous amount. Cuban music was tough had an amazing music supervisor, because a lot of it's not, um, American companies went and gobbled up all the well-known songs in Cuba, and then now they charge a lot for those. Uh, so you have to go and find the authentic Cuban music, and it's really hard to find where you find that, so that was a bit of a challenge. And then target audience, I would say for mine, um, I thought it'd be people who love to travel. I thought it'd be a little bit older because this, the, a lot of these farmers are older. Uh, what I love that's evolved is um, artists, a lot of people who love black and white film photography. And fine art museums have picked us up and started doing screenings. So that side of it has been a real pleasure. Yes, and get a lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully you can do a deal. <laughs> Uh, yes, so I guess it's for everyone, since you guys have been, uh, it sounds like you guys have had several successful like festival runs, and I just put my first kind of short post-college into the festival circuits. Uh, it's a little disheartening. I've gotten one exception into a festival I'm pretty sure I got into because they had like low submission rate. Uh, so I guess any tips, words of advice, encouragement for uh, festival yeah. submissions, just because uh, it can get pricey. Yeah, uh, it's so. so much to say about that. Yeah. yeah. Is, that, is, is, is your, is is your, your first film a short? narrative or a uh, narrative short? Yeah. Narrative short. Yeah. Is this your first? Is this your first short? Uh, outside of college, yes. Well, I mean that's the that's the answer. Just make yeah. a million. I mean, I I, sub I remember the film slam at Enzion here when I was in college. I submitted like. One ever, yeah, yeah. Clap it up for the Enzi on y'all. Um, but uh, no, I submitted like every every time I could, and like never won anything for years. You know, it's just I probably I probably made like 40, 40 to fifty short films um, since co like well, from the beginning of college till now. And he like, called our office a lot. Yeah, I, I like, yeah I, with locations and stuff. So like, and they only started getting good towards the end. So. Um, 
that I think that you know don't get disheartened. If, I mean, I don't. I, your film might be great and it might not be. I don't know. Um, but uh, <laughs> but I'm, I guarantee you they'll get better. At Ten short films from now, you know. Yeah, one of my favorite shorts that I made. I didn't get into like any festivals, um, but then others did. But like my the one like that I love the most was the one that like wasn't able or for some reason wasn't getting programmed. So it, it, these things are like really irrelevant to your your evolution as a filmmaker is like you just have to keep making stuff and it's not for the faint hearted it's you have to be so tenacious to do this and there's no financial reward for a long time um, I mean I feel like we've done a lot of work and we're still not even there so it's it's just about making as much work as you can and you know throwing things on the wall until something sticks so I would say don't you know like th that short that I made that didn't get into any festivals got distribution. So there's like this ran <laughs> it, there's, it's so random and it's like Russian roulette and it's it's irrelevant to to you. You know, it's just it's like outside box. Mm -hmm. So you just have to be really tenacious and keep making work. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, um, festivals are so wonderful and they're also an enigma and everybody you know it's down to a few people and their particular aesthetic and so for as many as we've gotten into we've been rejected from three times as many you know so um, and and this film is the like fourth film I've taken out on the circuit and some just never really went anywhere. Um, and, and what's wonderful about today's day and age is that there is a thriving online market for content. Mm. So um, you can, and a lot of films, you'll, you'll notice there are films that go to Sundance and are released on Vimeo on the same day. And that's like a new sort of, you don't have to wait for the festival run to be over. Some festivals want them not to be online and some festival for shorts and some festivals don't care and a lot don't care. Um, so you can do an online release. There's places like Short of the Week and Film Shortage and places that will release your film. You've got it on Vimeo and they've got their audience built in and you could have thousands of people see your film in, in a week, um, which is more than a festival. So just think about all the different types of ways you can get out there um, and keep writing and keep making your next film because you'll just continue to stay um, excited about something. Talk about a um, limited audience question. Um, I shot a short documentary last decade, all on mini DV. <laughs> it got in a film slam here, so you know, calling card. But just wondering if anybody's had experience with mini DV and trying to uh, attach it to a, a current wrap up, if you will, because that keeps sitting in the back of my head. Can I do it? My, the stuff we shot in 1999 was. Uh, mini on mini DV, a, a DV cam, mm -hmm. the professional version of mini DV. But we shot all that in 90. I have all these little tiny cartridges, um, and it's in the festival. Uh, so, who, so who's seen it? It looks pretty good for stuff from 1999. I had a very good DP, uh, and it still works. So, <clears throat> of course, it's 4.3. It's not 16.9, but that's fine because it's archival. But yeah, I have had no problem with that at all. It, it fits right in. Now I haven't had somebody say. Netflix has some stuff about it has to be 4K now and some junk like that. That won't happen. But I didn't have any problem with the mini DVs at all once I got them in. Put them in the Avid, which is the high quality codec, so that may help too. I, I think mini DV is probably pretty hot right now, actually. Everyone's trying to make their stuff look like mini DV, honestly. Yeah, yeah, yeah you <laughs> so should do it. I think you'll be all right. Well, thank you. I've gone into screenwriting since then, so it just sits in the back of my. Thank you very much. Yeah. I have a question for Postal. Uh, when you got the inspiration for that story, between then and when you actually started writing the screenplay, what was your outlining um, uh, breakdown process? Well, there's a lot of stuff that wasn't, you know, it's like not, you know, it's basically a news article. Um, and then I uh, had to make up a bunch of stuff. You know, there, like the movie, you know, if you watch the movie, it's almost like a, uh, like an up and down love story between the guy that works at FedEx and the guy that, you know, is on the phone with them. It's a made up, the company is, you know, it's called Bronco in the movie. I didn't want to get sued. I've been sued a few <laughs> times. Not for this movie, but by like Lamborghini and people I don't want to be sued by. Um, so uh, I completely just had to like create a character. The guy, the love story between that guy, you know, I was like, okay, this movie's not going to be able to exist if it's just literally one character by himself. It's just going to get stale in one house. So to create that other character that existed but is not true, not part of the true nature of what happened. Um, so it took like 
I'd say six months. I kind of just figured, I mean, honestly, if I had to go back and do it again, I would have taken longer, you know, developing a whole feature. I was way, na like, way too naive about it and shot the thing and then was like, wow, we need to add a lot of stuff and then went back and shot like, you know, 20% more. Um, so I would recommend like really working on the script a lot and then, and then not having to like, you know, screw yourself like in the middle of the movie and you're shooting it. Um, but yeah, uh, <laughs> some things I really don't think I can talk about, about the true nature of this movie, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, I'd say it took me six months, shot it, and then, and then another like, you know, a year of like sporadic shooting to fix all my problems and then editing for another year, all right, is, was that up to three years, what was that? I, I guess it was more about like how, how did you break out the, the actual story itself? To oh, okay, okay, all right. Uh, well, I mean, uh, this is writing for budget, right? So it's like, okay, I have this house. We're gonna take it's gonna take place in the house. So um, already limited there. So let's make it take place in a day. And there's a lot of flashbacks with his childhood and stuff. So you take the character, and you know you know what happened, right? So it's like he freaked out and lost his mind or whatever. And it's like let's go deep into that and just try and like. Slowly. Uh, did, wait, did you see? Did you watch the movie? Because I don't want to give. There's a lot of like things I'm about to give away. But like, you know, you find out things about the character as the movie goes on. So like, build like building that out is just ways to like increase drama without changing location or time or whatever. You know, it's, you're finding out that this guy was not proposing to his girlfriend. He was proposing to like his brother's fiance. And it was like things that you don't find out until like the end. Well, you know, like half, a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here. And that, that's how you keep the, you know, the drama of it. Just ruin the movie for everyone here. <laughs> it already screened. Like, there's no more screening, so. <laughs> I don't feel bad about it. Let's say you do a, a small film that turns out to be a relatively big film. It's well received, but you've done it with all non-union talent. Does that complicate distribution or acceptance in the marketplace? Not if they've got signed, if, you, if you're signed and you're cool with it. I mean, mm -hmm. if, if they've signed an official legal release, right? Lawyer up, and then you should be okay. okay. Are they not all non-union actors? Exactly. You know, yeah. they're just no friends, problem. relatives. If, yeah, if you have a release, fine. you're fine. Yeah, that's yeah. easier. Yeah. It, the problem would be yeah. doing a non-union <laughs> doing a, a, a short without going through SAG, but using SAG actors, that would be where you'd have, you potentially would have a problem. For the actor, the actors would have a problem. Yeah. Probably not you. Um, but if you've used non-union actors or non-actors or fa friends and family, um, if they have a, you have a good release that you can use their likeness, you have no issues with anything. Thanks. Hello, my question is for one child. Is there a shortage now of men or women in China? Because you did uh, mention in your movie that there was a shortage of young people. And also, during those 35 years, did the government offer um, birth control education and birth control to the population? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, the first question. Yeah, so the policy was enforced for 30, over 35 years, so it created a lot of consequences. Like when you mentioned this imbalance of gender, there are too many men for women, so, and also the society is aging. So this is one of the many uh, consequences of the, of the uh, policy. Uh, in our film, we didn't include every perspective of it because it's a broad topic. So we focus on the emotional journey of a, of my co-director. But this is a, the policy because it has changed the lives of so many hundreds of millions over the past few decades. So it's some, I hope that in the future, there will be more and more films to focus on the other perspective of the film, like the uh, imbalance of gender and all this thing. And the, and the sec second question regarding birth control measure, yes, the uh, government strongly uh, promote um, IUD and also sterilization. It's mandatory right, for, after you have a first baby in China, it's mandatory to have an IUD inserted. So that was under the one child policy. And the IUD in China was different, uh, d designed differently. It, it, once it was inserted, it needs a sur pr surgical procedure to take it out, and the doctor needs a permit to do that. So it, that's, that's something um, 
And I'm, I recently met an audience at Berkeley in San Francisco that she, she was a university student in, uh, teacher in China, and she was here a, a research fellow at Berkeley, and she told me that after she gave birth to her first child, who is her, own, her only daughter, and the hospital put the IUD in her body without telling her, yeah. and she didn't discover it until much later. And also uh, sterilization, so in a city, it will, you can only have only one child, but in a countryside, uh, the government let people to have a second child if your first child is a girl. So it, we call it 1.5 child <laughs> policy in China. So when, once you meet the allowable quota of children you're allowed to have, like one, the two maybe in the countryside, you are, it's mandatory you need to go through sterilization. And it, it can either be the mom or the dad, the family made a decision, but you just have to do that and if you refuse, there's consequence. But abortion was very big part of the implementation of the policy. I seen the government release a data that says that uh, under the one child policy, uh, about 330 million abortions were performed. That's about 30,000 abortion a day. And that, and for, for compared to IUD, IUD was 400 million, so the data was quite near, and then sterilization was over 200 million. So abortion was a big part of the implementation, I, and a lot of them are not uh, voluntary, uh, involuntary, yeah. Wow. Thank you. So one last question to wrap it all up. Let's go down the line. What has been your favorite part about being at the Florida Fem Festival so far? Like starting here? Go for um, it. Seeing old friends, honestly, it's probably different than most people. Yeah, just being back in Orlando. I live in Los Angeles now, so I, being back in Orlando, I, you know, I've been here a million times. That's definitely my, like actually being here with a movie of my own is pretty sweet, so I'd say that's probably it. Well, welcome back. Thank you. Well, I haven't screened, I haven't been to my screening yet, so um, that always says a lot about the film festivals. But I would say the caliber of work and so the filmmakers you get to meet, this is kind of our payoff as far as who we get to talk to and get inspired by. And it seems like a really great community that supports the festival, which is helpful for us. Uh, well, I would have to say, like I said, I was born and raised in Florida, so I should say my family coming down from Jacksonville for the screening, but I'm gonna pick something else. <laughs> uh, it's family, you know how that is. Uh, I would have to say that this is the first time it screened outside of Virginia. The first screening was at the Virginia Film Festival in November, which obviously is pretty close to Richmond, and then it's playing in Richmond next week, but this is the first screening outside of Virginia, and to have people who did not know who Dirt Woman was, didn't know anything about the movie, obviously, and embrace it, and it's amazing the response I've had from people who've seen it, and they really loved it, and that you know, gives me hope that somewhere outside of Richmond, people will enjoy it. Well, obviously they have, so that was really gratifying to me to see that it's being accepted on a wider scale. Yeah, um, this festival, every festival sort of has its own personality, and this festival has been just really fun and eccentric, and um, it's, been, it's been wonderful to also just meet all the young filmmakers and students. There's like a huge student filmmaker population here, and be able to talk to up-and-coming filmmakers, and um, that's been one of, the, one of the best things. We've just been here a day, so um, there's more to come. Show us more. And also, this panel's been wonderful. Um, I was here six years ago with a short film, and when I was here, I said I was going to make this movie. So coming back mm. with this movie, um, it just feels like coming back full yeah. circle and seeing all my friends and, and the um, administration here is so great and, and the community. So it feels like a kind of a homecoming. Oh, good. Yeah, so um, this is actually just my second day here. So, um, but everything's so great. And I, I never been to a theater like this. And yeah. it's just, yeah. it's really more about movie going. And I, and I have chance to see, first time I have chance to see movie yesterday. Yeah, just feel everything is, it's like I meet so many people that like, are passionate about movie mm -hmm. making. And it just have an interesting dialogue among yeah. filmmakers. It's been great, yeah. Wonderful, well thank you all so uh, much. One thing I want to say, yeah. if I could, is um, that I've never had a film festival is the students that you talked about. Yeah. So they set up marketing for, uh, right, for the right. features and that was amazing to have a student put a drag show on for mine. I know, they, they <laughs> did a photography show for mine, and that was like, to have someone working for you with that kind of exuberant 
newness was really great. That's a I, really cool I actually, thing. I used to be in that class. <laughs> and I, I know I'm not even kidding. I did. I did. Like I had students helping me this time, but I remember when I had to do it for someone's movie. And it was really weird to see it come full circle. That's One final quick shout out to the people at the festival. Yes. Everybody, the administration as well as all the volunteers have been incredibly welcoming and supportive, and that really makes you feel great. Thank you all Thank for you having all us. For yeah, it's great. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the festival.